Hey everyone, welcome back to the Danger Planet. I'm Sam. I'm Doug. And I'm Brandon. And today we're going to be giving you a spicy hot take on the new Gaining Ground 3 uh, tournament pack, which Weird Games just dropped on Wednesday of this week. We're giving you our absolute first impressions right off the dome with absolutely no thought or consideration put into them. Totally. But we're going to be talking about the new strategies, the new schemes, and the little core rule changes that might have a strong but subtle effect. And this first episode, it's a two-part series, guys, and the first episode is going to be on the strategies, and we're going to release another video, which is going to focus on the schemes, both focusing on the new release, Gaining Grounds 3, just like Sam said. So this past Wednesday, Weird uh, dropped the new Gaining Grounds season. Now, for those who don't know, Gaining Grounds is Weird's tournament packet. It has uh, rules for tournaments, and more importantly, it has new strategies and schemes that each tournament season will be played with. And so every time they drop Gaining Grounds, it really shakes up the metagame. So we're going to take a look uh, today at the different uh, changes that they've made to strategies and some little changes they've made to game rules. And those are pretty subtle, but they can have a big effect. So we'll, we'll start with the game rules. Um, there's one pretty significant change, and that is that whenever you have to pick something secretly uh, for a strategy or a scheme or uh, for you know any reason you would have to pick something secretly, you do so at the start of the game after models are deployed. And that's really relevant because formerly uh, you had to pick things like hidden martyrs before deployment, and then that affected the way you could deploy your models. Now you can get the full information of who's deployed what where before you pick things for vendetta for hidden martyrs and for similar schemes. Yeah, so that'll be kind of interesting. Release. Yeah, I think yeah. that I think that's going to be a huge deal because like there there were situations where it probably didn't matter, especially if you were you know you you knew what your target what your options were for schemes and you could deploy them in the second half of the crew if you were the attacker. But if you were the defender in some of those circumstances, you could get just blown out because your opponent has to put their their first half down. You put your whole keyword down, and then you're on the complete opposite side of the board with a model that will never get there. Yeah. Uh, so that's just I think that just is a better gameplay. It lets people make decisions with more complete information. Yeah, for sure. Um. The other little change is that uh, the bans format, which is very common, it's a way that basically you, uh, after opponent has picked their keyword, you can uh, announce a keyword and they're not allowed to hire anything from that keyword, including the master. Uh, it's now bans X, so you can have uh, tournament organizers pick multiple bans, which is pretty good because, you know, with some factions, you could have just two, three bans, and then you can make sure that if people are playing double masters, they're playing none of the really broken ones. So it's a way, if you don't want to straight up ban double masters, you can make them a bit more controllable. Yeah. I can't wait to run my first band seven tournament here at Battlegrounds. We're gonna you should do, do bands eight. Do band is eight? Yeah. Wild. Is it? It's just, that's just. That's just solos, right? Well, it doesn't. Well, it also yeah. means you can't hire yeah. anything from the keyword you declared. Yeah. No, so no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Okay. It does not mean that. Bands as a format means you can hire. You can't hire models that don't share a keyword with the master you declared. It doesn't the, right. you, from the keyword you choose. You, they share a keyword. Okay. You can choose. Them. Okay. That's not, no, that's not. Okay. 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 Anyways, uh, so let's talk about the strategies. Uh, now, the, all the strategies are brand new. None of them carried over. So we'll talk first about the crow strategy, cursed objects. Yeah. Uh, the way this works is after both players have deployed, starting with a player with initiative, you alternate placing curse tokens on your opponent's mark uh, models. And uh, you can have a total of five curse tokens out there. Minions can have a maximum of one token. Anyone else can have a maximum of two. Um, if you have a curse token, you can take the interact action to place that curse token on an enemy model within one inch of yourself. And you ignore that model's engagement range when you're doing so. Um, if a model that has one or more curse tokens on it is killed, the opposing player can discard one of those tokens, then take all the remaining tokens and place them on the closest models in the same crew, one each. And, uh, if a model is ever buried, its tokens are placed on models in the same crew chosen by the owner of that crew. And at the end of your turn, if you discarded at least one curse token, or if there are no enemy models in play, you gain a point. Uh, so this is a strategy that pretty much just rewards you for killing things. You need to kill models with curse tokens on them. If you do that, you discard the token, and now you've scored a point for the turn. So it seems pretty straightforward, but there's a couple of really interesting wrinkles in it. Mm -hmm. And the first one is that you choose which models you're trying to kill. Now, you can place five curse tokens. Everyone's going to have more than five models in their crew. Uh, so 
you can actually decide like which models are the ones you have to you want to target. But your opponent has some control over that too, because the other wrinkle here is that you can take the interact action defensively. Now you can actually cap out this ski, this strategy without ever taking the interact action, but. It is when you do interact, it's strictly defensive because when you interact, you get rid of one of your curse markers. And once you've done that, the model that you've gotten rid of curse marker off of is no longer a scoring target for your opponent. So I really like this strategy because it makes you take the interact action in a way that we don't normally see. It's purely defensive. Mm -hmm. And then finally, because uh, summoned models can never interact with strategy markers, and this uh, strategy has no strategy markers, it's I think the first one ever to have no strategy markers. Uh, what, what what that means is that uh, summoned models always get a curse token when they're summoned, which means if you summon models, you're giving your opponent more targets. Yeah, it, it is optional. You could theoretically choose not to, but I, I think that the case that you would do that is just so inevitably, so ridiculously slim. Like, you always are going to choose to. Yeah, so I really like this strategy. I think it's cool because, first of all, it encourages combat, which is good for strategies. You want to encourage interaction. Mm -hmm. And it also makes... Uh, makes like you take the interact action in a circumstance that you wouldn't normally think about it. You can't be proactive. You have to be reactive. Yeah. But because the only engagement range that's ignored when you do that in action is the engagement range of the model you're putting it on, you can kind of mess with your opponent's ability to interact by pairing your models together or using these two-inch engagement ranges. Yeah. I think I think that this strategy in particular really makes two-inch engagement range models, especially as just sort of shepherds for your weaker targets, uh, a really interesting sort of uh, grouping um, like mini bubble scenario. I'm looking forward to seeing if that's uh, if that's like a viable strategy to play uh, to to run some of those. Yeah, um, what I was going to say is, what do you guys think are archetypes of models that would be successful in executing the core game plan of this strat? And what do you think are like some crews that come to mind that you think would be good at this? Yeah, so, so you, offensively, oh, I think, you know, murder, murder machines, anything that can do huge heavy damage, min three beaters, things like that. Defensively, though, uh, you know, just tough, durable things, things that can survive, things that have hard to kill, um, things that can take some punishment and then sort of make it out. Uh, and then also the two inch models. I think that the two inch reach models, like the little like 30 mil two inch reach models that can just run around and provide cover to their buds. That's going to be a big deal. Uh, I would say ranged models are have a big advantage here because they can uh, attack enemy models to kill them without putting them in range to get interacted on and have curse tokens put on them. Oh. So I think this definitely favors ranged over melee crews. That's wild. Um, yeah, I didn't even think but, about that. Uh, also, there are some very specific models that have advantages here. Like, for example, the journalist keyword, you cannot interact to give a journalist model your curse token. So journalists, if the journalist keyword really wants to do it, they can like get out there, interact on you to shove curse markers on you and just lock you out of the strategy entirely. Now, journalists aren't Nelly super 2. killy. 2.0, let's go. Yeah. Journalists are not super killy, so they might have a hard time scoring it, but you only need to kill one model per turn to score. So I think this is Nelly is a, a model we haven't seen that much of recently, but I think this could really like put some you know pep in her step. Yeah, I think Nelly's I think I think there. Nelly's Nelly's definitely be looking for some cursed objects. That's for damn sure. Yeah. So that's right. cursed objects. Yeah. So what's next? Uh, well, next we're going to talk about guard the stash. Now, guard the stash is very interesting. Uh, it drops strategy markers like many other strats, but it does them in a way that we have never seen before. So you put one strat marker um, on each table quarter center, just as you are familiar with from turf war and corrupted ley lines. But then instead of putting one in the center, you put two on the center line, each four inches to the right and left of the center point. And height, the strategy markers are height five blocking and passable, just you know the same as corrupted ley line markers. And what you're interested in doing at this point is controlling strategy markers. And the way you control them is if you have more models that do not have summon upgrades within two inches and line of sight of the marker than the opposing player. Uh, and you get one victory point if you control more strategy markers that are not completely on your own table half than victory points you've scored from this strategy. Now, the, there's a few things that pop out from this strategy to me. The first is you do not interact at all mm -hmm. to do this strategy. You do not take the interact action. It does not impact the strategy whatsoever. Yeah, I think it's. I think it might be the first strategy for that for which that's true. Um, second thing is that uh, whether you are on a diagonal or straight uh, deployment is hugely impactful on this one because if you're in a straight deployment, there are two or six strategy markers on the board. There are two that you can gain no benefit from, and you just defend. And then there are four that you can potentially score from. And because you need to control all four to score your fourth point, you're pretty strictly limited. If you're deploying on a diagonal deployment zone, there are 
five you can score from and only one you can't. So fundamentally, it is easier to score this on diagonal maps. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I th I think having a, a, a almost a modal strategy, depending on your deployment, is very, very interesting. And I really, really hope that we see more of this in the future. But um, yeah, I think this this the strat seems really straightforward. Uh, I think that like you want fast movie models that can run around and, and tag things. I think uh, you know evasion mechanics are really, really powerful. Um, and uh, you know, massing like lures and obeys are also going to be really strong in this pool. Silverids and Zorida. So, yeah. Oh, and uh, uh, so the the other thing that I, I want to do, it, it's my goal to do with this at some point, it is I want to block it. line of sight to a strategy marker to somebody, which is almost impossible. The only thing that I think can do it might be Zoraida, um, because Zoraida 2's potion can increase her size 4 models to size 5, which means you could run them in between models Al Alphonse to block their control. Alphonse will wear a ghillie suit and then grow up and be size 5. That's wild. So you can do it. We can do it in Zor I think we can do only do it in Neverborn and, and Bayou. Yep, I think that's it. We're gonna. Wait, um, how big is a uh, bit uh, Calypso? Calypso's four. Curses. Yeah. Oh, you can put. You can put. Uh, no, that's not true. Es can do it because Es can get the butler, and the butler can. Oh, bellhop porter. One bellhop porter. The bellhop porter can give one extra size to Calypso yeah. or Tide Caller. I think so. Yeah. Isn't that only Sh -sh -sh -sha, like my friend? Mm. that's pretty uh, cool yeah like it's, that. it's gonna be that's cool. cool that's that's like my own like little mini game that i'm gonna be trying to do but yeah so um, this one's very really interesting because nice summoned track. models can't control strategy markers um that again it kind of gives summons a little bit which is good because they there's no you can interact with strategy markers in this so you don't they don't get hurt that way um i will say also that this is a, a this is a strategy that rewards you having a large number of significant models because that's how you determine who controls the strategy marker, just number of models. And given that GG2 has really pushed people towards these small elite crews, it's nice to see a strat that has like larger crews. Yeah. Also, uh, Bellhop Porter doesn't do it. It only gives them plus one size during their activation. RIP. Lame. Rip Explorers. Dig All right. <laughs> cancel your faction. Choose another one. Okay. Let's talk about Carve Path then. Carve a path. Oh man, you guys are both pumped about Carve a path. I remember. Oh, I'm pumped. He's uh, a Bob's the team, my friend. Yeah, we played a Carve a path game last night, and it was very short but very neat. It's an interesting so, strat. Carve a path is the Ram strat. Uh, the way this works is after deployment zones are chosen, starting with the defending player, each player alternates creating strategy markers until you've created two on your table half that are ten inches away from each other and from the center line. The strategy markers are only concealing. That means you can move through them. Uh, friendly models that are within one inch of a strategy marker can take an interact action, even if they're engaged, to push it six inches if it's a friendly marker or four inches if it's an enemy marker. And if the strategy marker touches impassable terrain, it stops. But if it touches another type of marker, it just removes the marker and keeps its push going. Uh, if it's completely on the opposing player's table half, it's worth one point. If it's completely on the opposing player's deployment zone, it's worth two points. Actually, it doesn't have to be completely within, just in their deployment zone, it's worth two points. Yeah, com and it's completely on have, table half and just touching their deployment zone. Right. And if you have more points worth of markers on the board than points you've scored, you get a point. Uh, so this strategy is very, very cool for uh, very a couple of reasons. Now, the last two, I talked about how you don't have to take the interact action. Like, you don't, you don't take it at all and guard the stash, and you only take it defensively in cursed objects. You take the interact action a lot in Carve the Path. And the more your opponent takes it, the more you have to take it. So that's the first thing that sort of I thought about, is that this is one that really rewards you taking the interact action, and especially models that can interact, move, interact, uh, like if they have a leap or something. Silerids. Uh, the exactly. The other thing about this is that marker masters, of which there are quite a lot now, especially with Malifaux Burns, just get hosed by this. It yeah, gives every single crew in the game uh, a, a version of parker dead man walking or bass badland sheriffs action chaos in the badlands slash order in the badlands where they push a marker and remove all markers it touches this, this is just is like, a super version of that this is like the this is like the strat that you simply don't really want to take a marker dependent master into yeah you'll uh, just lose like you yeah. just lose you need uh, a, you need a master that doesn't depend on markers so yeah i needed to not take mayfang 2 into von struck 1 and summarily get wham boom wangled uh, by Brandon in about like, I think ten net activations. So that's yeah. pretty rough. Rip yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. The other thing is that you do have to push two, um, two, uh, you know, carts or whatever they are, all the way into your opponent's deployment zone to score with this. But uh, you don't have to push your two. 
Uh, no, you do friendly oh, friendly do. strat markers completely. Okay, yeah, so that's cool. But you can defensively you, you, can defensively you can defensively push your opponents back across the line or out of your deployment zone with your. But yeah, you can also, kick them backwards. Yeah, it's more efficient for them to push them forward than it is for you to push them backwards. Mm -hmm. Correct. So there's a lot six, of it's six players. forwards, four backwards. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot of really cool play. I like yeah. this one. A and lot. then so the the other the the two the two sort of th notes that I have from being able to play through a turn in this was that you have so when you place your two markers, they're both going to be in your deployment zone on standard deployment wedge. They could potent one could be in your deployment zone uh, corner and flank. I just can't even contemplate right now. But I think you can get both in your deployment zone and flank. So you can start with models basically touching them, which is which is neat. Um, and then or on top of them because you can touch and stand on them because they're only concealing. Um, and then the, the other thing that I really like is just the fact that they're concealing, right? They're concealing yeah. so you can sort of use them defensively to block line of sight to your dudes or accidentally throw them in front of your thing that you really need to go off. Um, oh, no. But yeah, though they're very they're they're real good. Um, I I really like this carve a path. I, I, and and the oh the other the other the other big thing I think is so even though they start ten inches apart, you can very easily slam them together in the first turn and then sort of run a spearhead carving a path straight down the board. But also I think you could you could have sort of a plan where you just break your crew off into two bubbles and some of the some of the crews that that sort of are designed around having two little area of bubbles that sort of push off and act independently might might really do well quite well in this game in this uh, i think there's that. a lot of ways to score this game oh for strat. sure yeah absolutely uh and I'm, I'm very excited to see where this goes all right so then the last one is covert operations the mask strat uh this is i think one. this one is sick and also as sick. a max two player i mm -hmm. saw this and was like holy schmeckles so this one is after you choose deployment zones, you drop two markers on the center line, uh, four inches to the right and left of the center point, then two more on the center line, six inches to the left and right of the table edges. Uh, they're height five, blocking and passable. After deployment, every model gets a claim token. Um, and the, during the start phase of every turn after the first, you secretly choose up to three models in your crew. And at the end of each turn, you reveal the chosen models. Then one of those models that is not engaged by an enemy model may lose their claim token to put it on a strategy marker within two inches of themselves. And once you've done that, you've claimed the marker, and so you get a point for having you know markers claimed. Um, this strategy reminds me, first of all, a lot of Corrupted Ley Lines. It is, in many ways, very similar to Corrupted Ley Lines, but it has some pretty important differences. The first one is, in Corrupted Ley Lines, there are five Ley Line markers you're trying to claim, so inevitably to score four points you can leave one of them this one there's only four markers to claim you have to claim them all if you want to cap yeah uh the second thing is that in corrupted ley lines you have one model that can score at a time but it can be any model in your crew because you can pass the marker around in this uh each model in your crew can score it's not insignificant obviously each model in your crew can score once there is no way to get more claim markers there is no way to get rid of claim markers except for killing the model that's carrying them so there's a very limited budget of scoring you can do, and you need to plan that in advance. You need to plan it in advance on the turn level, picking which three models are going to be eligible to score this turn. But you need to plan it at the start of the game, too, and throughout as you move and deploy. Because if you have, you know, say, your crew split, you have half of it go left, half of it go right, you claim one of the left markers, your opponent kills all your guys on the right. I mean, you can't claim anything on the right. You need to move your models over there. Um, so this is going to be a, a, because there, there's no actual killing involved in the actual scoring of this, um, but there is some, you know, activation control involved, because if you can get that last activation, you can move your model in to engage enemy models so they can't drop their strat markers. Um, however, if you can choose who you kill and target models that haven't dropped off their claim markers, you can lock your opponent out of scoring points. Absolutely. <clears throat> I, and I think the other thing that's really interesting about this, and I, I completely agree, Sam, it does feel a lot like Corrupted Ley Lines. The thing that I, I really like is it sort of builds towards a, a, a point, right? So if both players are playing at a, at a very high level and both players are, are scoring and claiming things as you go, you'll get to a point where there's like one or two markers left. And then you can defend the, the, the strategy markers because all you have to do to stop them from interacting is just engage them in melee. Right. And then oh, yeah. or, or from uh, not from interacting, but claiming it. And that's not a that's not an interact action. That's not a thing that can get around, get, be, get can be gotten around by don't mind me. I don't believe. Right. Because that's just interact. So you, if you engage them in melee, you, they just can't score. They can't discard their token. Um, and so like being able to sort of plan and see where your opponent's going and then react to their plan to shut them down is a really, really interesting high level play strat that this scheme opens up. And it's I can't wait to big brain Zoraida somebody out what, of it. What I was thinking about specifically 
was controlling the death of Max to move her along the middle board and then using her engagement range to deny late stage points and also kill things. Yeah. Yeah. Max is pretty good on this one. Now yeah. I will say, uh, I, there's one thing I don't like about this, which is that it very strongly rewards like the sort of pass token generation activation control game, which I don't love because I don't like, I think the act the alternating activations part of Malifo is like a huge part of the game that makes it so good. And the fact that there's a very strong strategy that basically tries to just like completely obviate that part of the game has always kind of sat, sat with me the wrong way, but I accept that it is a part of the game and it's a powerful strategy. It's just, it's very strong here. If you have activation yeah. control, if you can get the last two activations, you can just like completely I, I, screw your opponent. I could see a Chiang Gong, Neverborn, or Yuko crew just like running fucking train. Uh, I, but also, Yuko's a really strong like master in this, and she's kind of been weak lately. So yeah. it's neat that's to good. see these that's weaker good. masters getting a little bit above a, of a buff. Yeah, I definitely can't wait to try the Hinamats crew in covert operation. The Hinamats crew. The Hinamats crew. All right. So uh, yeah, those are the four new strategies. Guys, uh, what do you think? What are your sort of uh, hot takes on these? What are you looking forward to trying? What do you think maybe is going to be a bit weaker? So one of the things that I think is interesting is that they have provided us with core, uh, core strats that don't all require a ton of AP spam uh, to convert to points. You can play them in different ways, which is interesting. Uh, and also, I'm really excited to not have to deal with symbols of authority anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I was sick of symbols. Uh, I do feel, I remember on some of the recent videos we've been talking about, well, this master seems like kind of okay, but maybe if there's a lot more scheme marker stuff going on and or interacting stuff going on in the next gaining grounds, they'll be better. And I think that outside of Carver Path, this is not a very interaction heavy uh, strategy pool. Like there's really only, there's, there's two strats that you don't interact at all. And then there's one where you interact a ton. And then there's one where you interact in kind of a unique defensive way. Yeah, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, just trying out some new masters with these. I think that weird uh, consistently like shows that they're not only interested in making sure that different models, especially ones that maybe haven't been as strong in the past, are, are used and refreshed. And I think that these four uh, new strategies really, really highlight some significant flex out of what Gaining Grounds 2 was and into the, the new season. And I think that a lot of new masters that haven't shined in a while are really going to are going to are going to do their bit. Well, everyone, that was the new strategies and the rules changes. Uh, there's a lot of cool new stuff going on. Really looking forward to getting into it. Uh, but we hope you liked that video. And stay tuned because soon we're going to be coming out with a second spicy hot take about the new schemes. We'll see what's changed, what stayed the same, and what's totally brand new. Yeah. So until next time, please, if you like this content, drop us a like, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment where you talk about the new strategies and what you're looking forward to doing. And please check us out in our Discord. The link's in the description. We'll be talking about new gaining grounds, Malifo in general, and just all kinds of games and fun and hobby stuff. Now, Sam. Yes, Doug? Touchdown in the land of the Delta Blue. I deserve this. In the <laughs> How far did you get? How far did you I get into like this farce? He yet. did it with like three masters. It's fine. Right. Yeah, Silurids are really good in this DG. Silurids, Sil Silurids, fuck. Silurids in this gaining grounds seem spicy. He was being that was a little, funny okay. as hell. It wasn't funny. You're stupid. That was stupid and Law. confusing. Oh, you're mean as hell. No, you're stupid and confusing because the way I we're told gonna you present I was that data. To do that. I, I know, but the way we present the data is that we present it in a chopped up format where you can click into the master. We could go into a private room oh, no. in Discord. All right, let's uh, let's do some gaining grounds, my friends. You're never gonna you're never gonna lose me. Oh, well, I can't rickroll him because I don't know the lyrics. It's, I'm never gonna you give mean, you up. I'm never yeah, gonna never gonna. Give that's the order we did last time. Is it? I'm very sure that it I is. I thought we did some crazy fucking order, no, but that's fine. It's fine. Okay, we'll, that's fine. I don't think we'll ever know because there's no audio recording. Yeah. yeah. Well, we no, there is. It's just Sam's audio it's recording. Just Sam it's actually Sam. really funny to listen to because it's like Sam's like, oh yeah, I agree. And then it's like 35 seconds of silence. And he's like, no, 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 you're way off base. Other people's mouths oh. move, but nothing comes out. Yeah, and you just yeah. <laughs> Sam's just crazy talking to himself. So. Yeah. None of you exist. You're all just figments of my imagination. <laughs> yeah. Like right. Astrid's like trying to have me institutionalized because right. I keep talking to myself. All right, Grandpa, <laughs> let's get you to bed. <laughs>